But now, I would like to introduce Dr. Julia Moore. She is the Executive Director for the Center for Implementation. Julia is known internationally for her ability to com communicate complex implementation science concepts in a clear and practical way. She has developed the online mini course, Inspiring Change, Creating Impact with Evidence-Based Implementation, which has been completed by over 4,000 professionals from around the world. I've worked with her myself. She is phenomenal at guidance, leadership, and calm insights that really, really you can take to your workplace and implement immediately. So thank you, Julia, for joining us. She'll be providing five great tips to enhance planning for adaptations. Welcome, Julia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. And it is so, so exciting to be here and really exciting to be part of such an interesting virtual conference uh, that is set up so nicely. I feel like uh, it's always interesting to see what will happen in this new virtual environment, but there are so many different exciting things uh, going on in this conference. That's really wonderful. I particularly liked Dr. Robin's talk. I feel like it set the stage for what is happening now, how to remember how to be resilient, but then also how to take that back to your actual safety improvement projects and think about all of the amazing work you've done so far and then what you can do from here. So I am gonna talk right now about five tips to enhance planning for sustainability. So I know lots and lots of you and I know lots of you know me, we've spent a lot of time together over the past year and a half, but since we were last together and kind of really regularly connecting, a lot of things have changed. Obviously, the pandemic has happened, and that means that your day-to-day -day work and lives look really, really different. And because they look different, I think that it can be easy to get a little bit lost or confused or not sure how to get back to what you were originally intending to do and how you might need to change things given the way that the world looks today. So when we were planning for closing Congress, we started talking about what would be the things that people, this, the safety improvement project teams could benefit from most right now. What are the questions you have? What are the challenges you're experiencing? And one of the really big themes is the fact that everyone needs to make adaptations right now. We all need to change the way we work and the way we live and understanding how to make adaptations, but using our underlying implementation science principles can really help us. So we have been on a journey for a year and a half in thinking about implementation science and how you can apply implementation science and quality improvement to enhance the way that you create change in your organization. And when you are doing that, you are not just doing it by chance. You are not just rolling the dice. Throughout this entire journey, you have been more and more strategic and systematic in how you think about change. You've thought really hard about who is on your implementation team and who do you need to engage. You've thought really hard about the barriers and facilitators to change and then mapped those barriers and facilitators to an underlying theory of change and then use that to pick the very best implementation strategies to address your local barriers and facilitators. You spent time thinking about how can you implement with high quality or fidelity? And you thought about things like, how can you effectively plan for sustainability? But right now, the world looks a little bit different. And so chances are you need to make some adaptations. And so I'm going to go through and talk about five tips that you can use for your safety improvement projects, but in fact, for any work you're doing or changes you need to make, either because of the pandemic or more broadly, because these five tips are relevant for all different kinds of changes and adaptations that you might need to make. So I'm gonna go through each of the five tips. I'm gonna go kind of present them all, go through them one by one, 
And then we are going to do an activity. I wished that we could still do one of our fabulous annotate activities where you guys draw all over the screen, but that is not possible here. So instead, we're going to use the chat box function. That means that I want you to start, as I'm presenting, start typing things in the chat box that you think about when I start talking through these. Think about how this relates to your own safety improvement project and how you might need to be making some of these kinds of adaptations as you go. So the five tips include, number one, engaging key stakeholders. Number two, understanding why you are making these adaptations. Number three, closely related, but a little bit different, is what is the purpose or the goal for making your adaptations? Number four is about describing exactly what those adaptations look like. And finally, number five, making sure you're hypothesizing the potential impact of different kinds of adaptations. So let's go through each of those. First, Throughout this entire journey and all of your work with Canadian Patient Safety Institute, I hope that you have taken away a key message that you should always be engaging key stakeholders in the work that you do, in the change initiatives that you are part of. That involves thinking about all different kinds of key stakeholders. Maybe that's clinicians or multiple different groups of clinicians. Maybe it's non-clinical staff within your hospital or organization. That also includes patients and family members, essentially anyone who could be impacted by or benefit from the changes you are talking about making. In this case, the adaptations you're talking about making should be invited to the table, sometimes a virtual table, to contribute their thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Once you have engaged and identified all those key stakeholders, engage them. You can start asking yourself a bunch of different questions. The first question is really about understanding why you are trying to make adaptations. What problem are you trying to address? Or what is the reason that suddenly you need to make these adaptations or these changes from your original plan? Obviously, many of us are dealing with adaptations as a result of COVID and suddenly needing to do things virtually, for example, closing Congress. But there are lots of other reasons we need to make adaptations. Things like staff turning over or realizing that the logistics of the original intervention don't really work in your setting. Or maybe there have been structural changes within your unit that mean that things can't run exactly the same way you were planning for them to go. There are so many different reasons that you might need to make adaptations. If you can pause, sit down, think through them and list them, it can really, really help you. From there, you wanna think about a related concept. Number three is about understanding the purpose and the goal for making those adaptations. Essentially, it isn't asking the question about why are you doing it, but what is the goal? What is the purpose of making this adaptation? It's often the flip side of that coin but really clearly defining that can be so, so helpful. So maybe it's because you want to maintain connection even though you're in a virtual space. Maybe it's because you still wanna serve the same number of patients even though you need to do it virtually. I, earlier this week, was, was working with a group. I was doing a coaching session with a group. And they had an adaptation that they needed to make primarily because of COVID. And they said, you know, we used to do this thing. We were actually making a lot of progress when the pandemic hit. We sort of stopped doing it. We've recognized we need to start doing this again, but we need to make changes. We need to make adaptations. 
So they, so from there, we sat down and said, okay, great. They convened with lots and lots and lots of stakeholders. And they came up with this amazing, amazing list of ideas and suggestions about what they could adapt. They had 17 things that they were proposing to do on their adaptation list. And they came to me and said, I think it's probably not a super strategic list since we have 17 of them. And they wanted help to figure out how to be more strategic about planning those adaptations. So we sat down and I started by saying, well, tell me exactly the problem you're trying to address. And they said, the problem we're trying to address has to do with the fact that this is now a virtual patient encounter instead of being in person. And we normally have patients and caregivers as part of this encounter. And now we can't do it the same way. And I said, okay, great. Now, what is the goal that you have right now in making this adaptation? Not the problem, what's the goal? And they said, a big part of this is building a strong relationship so that they trust us and essentially tell them what's really, really happening. And they said, that is the part that we are finding the hardest to do virtually. And I said, well, great. So sit down and look at the 17 things you have come up with and figure out which of those 17 things helps you directly address your goal. You have some great ideas on there, but you're not gonna be able to do all of them. So prioritize the ones that have to happen and the ones that help you get to your goals. And when you do that, you can really focus your energy on the things that are gonna give you the biggest bang for your time. Once you do that, so now you've convened stakeholders, you know the problem you're addressing and making adaptations, you know the goal of your adaptations, then you can start thinking about what kinds of adaptations are you making? Honestly, this is where people get the most kind of confused because they're kind of throwing everything into the same pot. But you have spent so much time building out your safety improvement projects in really strategic ways that you know the different components of your safety improvement project. And you can use that as you're planning for adaptations. For example, you want to figure out, are you making adaptations to the what? Or are you making adaptations to the how? Remember that your what is all about the actual practice changes you're asking people to make. If this is Enhanced Recovery Canada or Team Steps or uh, Med Safety, this is about what is it that you actually want clinicians to do differently? For example, following guidelines or using new tools and how you are going to get them to change their behavior are those implementation strategies, education, reminders, opinion leaders, champions, audit and feedback, role modeling. So you can ask yourself, do we need to make changes to the what? Or do you need to make changes to the how? So are you changing the guideline recommendations and making adaptations to those? Or are you making changes to the education strategy and how that's being delivered? Or maybe you're making changes to both of them. Really teasing those apart is one of the most helpful steps in thinking through your adaptations because it can really help you effectively communicate what it is you're adapting and what part of your intervention that relates to. Once you have an idea of those pieces, then tip number five is about pausing and taking a moment to hypothesize what is the potential impact of making this adaptation. We know that certain adaptations can be detrimental and others might not be so bad. For this, I love the analogy of making changes or remodeling a house. 
Imagine that you have a house and you want to make some changes, some adaptations to that house. It is a great idea to change the paint color on the house. It is a great idea to put in new light fixtures, maybe even new cupboards to make it look different, to make it look exactly like your target audience wants it to look, to really appeal to them. It is not a good idea to go tearing down walls unless you know which walls are structural. You don't want to be tearing down the structural walls of your intervention, the core components that really are the pieces that help actually create change. Because if you tear those down, suddenly your intervention might not be effective anymore. And so if you can really think about what might happen if we make this change, that can help you think about whether that's a good idea or not a good idea. Some changes are gonna have to happen even if they are structural, because of the nature of the fact that our world looks pretty different right now. But in fact, a lot of things can still be there, even if, for example, they're delivered differently. Let's take the example of education. Education might go from being in-person to being virtual, but if the core content is there and that core content continues to address the underlying barriers to change, then you have continued to think about the theory of change and address those underlying barriers, which increases the likelihood you will be successful. So if you are ever in doubt, always go back to thinking about those barriers and facilitators and your theory of change. Think about the combi. Is this going to affect our ability to think, increase people's capability, their opportunity, or their motivation? So with that, we have these five different tips that you can use when you go back to your organizations and think about your safety improvement projects, but honestly, thinking about any of the work that you need to adapt right now. Ask yourself, who do I need to involve? Who are the key stakeholders? Why do we need to make adaptations? What is the problem we're addressing here? And what is the goal in making the adaptations that you need to make? Then clearly define those adaptations, thinking about what is it you want people to do differently and how, do you, um, and how you're gonna change their behavior. Are you making changes to the what? Or are you making changes to the how or maybe both? And then don't forget to hypothesize the potential impact of those adaptations. If you come across adaptations that you think, ooh, we need to make this change even though it might be detrimental, make a flag that that's probably something you're gonna have to go back and change once we're able to do that again. But for the other things that aren't detrimental, that are just about repainting and redecorating your intervention, go forward and make those changes so that you can adapt the intervention, so that people continue to use it, so that you continue to see the benefits of that intervention on clinical outcomes. So with all of that, we're going to jump into an activity. So in this scenario-based activity, what I have now is a situation. So I took one of the safety improvement projects, Enhanced Recovery Canada, because it's pretty easy for everyone to understand, even if you're not on the ERC team. And in this situation, the what, we're going to say at a simple level, are the clinical recommendations. There's guidelines, and the what is equal to those recommendations in the guidelines. Let's imagine that one of the safety improvement teams is implementing three different implementation strategies. Education, champions, and they are doing a site visit. That's one happened pretty commonly because people said, ooh, we can't envision exactly what it looks like to implement ERC. And so they started doing site visits to see what that looked like in sites where that was already happening. 
Imagine you sit down with the team and the team says, well, we've had some challenges. We sat down with key stakeholders, talked about a whole bunch of different things, the problem, our goals, the kind of adaptations we need to make. And here is kind of where we are. We want to continue to use ERC during the pandemic. And we even have data to show that this is actually working. So we are very, very excited about that and want to maintain those outcomes. But COVID has affected our ability to implement three of the recommendations. So three of them aren't really working very well anymore. And we can't do site visits because of COVID. Also, not because of COVID, there were staffing changes and specifically our main champion left. So it feels as though there's a lot of things happening and we don't really know where to go from here. So now I want you to support this team through the chat box, so adding comments in, and help them think through each of the different aspects of their intervention. So thinking through all, well, actually, we're going to think through four of the tips. So we're going to assume that they have met with their stakeholders. So we don't need to tell them how to do that. They've done that. And then I want you to help think through what do you think are some of the reasons they are making adaptations? What do you think is the purpose or the goal in making these adaptations? Do you think they need to make adaptations to the what, the how, or both? And what do you hypothesize are the potential impacts of those kind of adaptations? Simultaneously, if you can immediately think of how this relates to your own project, you are welcome to type that into the Q&A. And um, so I can then respond, come up with some ideas and suggestions, or even share with the group if you have some amazing examples of ways that you have adapted that you think would benefit others, because I think everyone would love to hear that. So please start typing in the chat box. And we're going to start by asking, what do you think are the reasons people are making adaptations or what problem are they trying to address? So out of curiosity, Julia, do you, do you, do you have some examples, maybe some areas that they might be exploring into while well, we're just waiting for a couple of the uh, replies in the chat box? Can you, can you guide them towards a certain mindset or anything? What, what kind of examples come up at this kind of stage? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, I think the big, big obvious one everyone is talking about right now is COVID. Everyone says, well, I have to change because of COVID. And so I say, okay, well, but what do you actually have to change, right? What things have gone virtual? But in hospitals, for example, there's some stuff that hasn't gone virtual, hasn't actually changed. So let's think through what are actually the things that are different. And I think that when you can really clearly define what is different, it can help you figure out what to do from there. One perfect example is I was talking to someone who said, we used to do interprofessional meetings. And now because of COVID protocols, we're not allowed to interprofessionally sit down in this small room all together anymore. So like, what do we do instead? And so then if you can sit down and say, okay, well, what's the goal of this meeting? And how can you achieve those goals? Even if you can't sit all together in the same room, then you can really help think through in a systematic way what is happening there. That's great. Uh, I do see that we have some answers coming in mm -hmm. here. Can you see those, Julia? Yes, I can see those. Great, so great. lots of things. Um, changing a uh, staff turnover. So it sounds like clearly staff turnover. And we know, I will talk about barriers and facilitators later this afternoon. We know staff turnover was a problem long before COVID for many of your projects. I see people talking about changing landscapes, um, the way that care is delivered because of COVID, introductory, introduction of mandatory virtual care, how to navigate virtual care, competing priorities and virtual care is changing how people are actually doing everything. And so exactly, I want to flag that as you are sitting down and having virtual care conversations, these five tips can help you do that. We have been in conversations with people in hospitals, in long-term care, in primary care, 
and even in public health dealing with the opioid crisis around let's sit down and think through these five questions to help you think about how you can do virtual care for this situation. So from there, let's think about the next question, which is what is the goal in making this adaptation? I threw on here a few examples of the kinds of things that we might hear, but I would love to also hear additional examples. And I think the more specific that you can be about the goals you are trying to achieve in making this adaptation, the easier it is for you to set yourself up for success. And remember, we've talked about that a lot. The goal here is to set you and your team up for success. So what are some of those goals that you have? Yeah, I'm seeing uh, in your examples, for example, uh, deliver training and make, make sure that there's sustainability. The improvements have to be sustainable whenever you try and make any kind of these changes, address the knowledge barriers, uh, sort of a, a fluffy way of saying, hey, there are some hurdles you're going to have to overcome when you are trying to make this knowledge translation happen. So. I would love to see some of the responses in the chat area you know, talking about sort of specifically what kind of problems we have to address with this. I, I love this example slide. Thank you so much for that, Julia. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that a big part of that that can really help us is thinking about when you can really hone in on why, what it is that you are trying to achieve. And then you can link that back to your barriers and facilitators. Then it helps you when you get to that question number five about, how might this affect what it is that you're doing, right? So when you can link those pieces together, I think it can really, really help. Um, oh, I hear, I see some great interesting examples here that some people are talking about how they might need to be doing virtual pre-op training um, to ensure that patients feel prepared before they even come in. So a huge thank you to Angela for saying that one. I actually have not... Um, encountered anyone who had that plan before, but it is absolutely brilliant and seems like it would work very, very well um, for this situation. Um, ooh, I really like this as well. The idea that we need to have some adaptations to continue the momentum. And so I think that sometimes reinvigorating things to build and continue the momentum that you started with can be very, very powerful. So keep them coming in and I will now go to the next one, which is, can you think about in this situation, they were talking about having three recommendations that they need to do differently. And they also have some problems because things are now virtual and the champion is gone. Not because of COVID, the champion is just gone. So are, does this mean that they need to make adaptations to the what or adaptations to the how? And so these ideas of doing things like pre-op training videos are perfect, perfect examples where they're making adaptations to the what because all that pre-op work is part of the actual clinical recommendation. So they're changing how that clinical recommendation is delivered. They're not changing how they're training clinicians, they're changing how they're actually delivering those recommendations. That one, that one was a little puzzling to me because changing mm -hmm. the how, the way, the way you're talking about it, uh, how could be delivery or what is delivery? It's, um, can, can you maybe explain that a little bit yeah, better yeah, to me? While they're um, jumping on the chat window to answer some of the other yes. what's, please. So actually, so that's actually a really good distinction. So the what in this situation, is about helping clin or helping patients do something differently. And the how is how are you going to get clinicians to deliver this intervention? So the, the kind of pure recommendations are about what clinicians are doing for patients. And then the how are the strategies you're using to change clinician behavior to deliver this intervention. So if you are gonna change the way you do pre-op training with patients, you're changing the how, what? You're changing the what? If you're changing how you train clinicians, you're changing the how. Does that help, Chris? 
It does, yeah. Whether it's a sheet of paper or a video conference, this is the same. These are just a change in the what. You're not actually changing the actual deliverable on the how. So that does differentiate, and thank you very much. I think we had Karen and Venetia speak in here. Yeah. Um, so strengthen linkages with other um, healthcare providers to provide care in the community. Excellent. So that is a wonderful, wonderful example of something that we'll need to change. And to continue to provide the best care, um, best patient care without all professionals on site. So Karen, yes. So that sounds like you are potentially describing the goal there. The goal is about how do we provide that very best care, even if all the clinicians are not in fact on site. Demetra talks about sustaining improvements and focusing on low hanging fruits in the context of COVID. Yes, so I am a huge fan of low hanging fruits as well. Find things that you can do successfully right now. Because who was it was talking about momentum earlier? Angela was talking about momentum. And when you can start building that momentum, it can be very, very powerful in all the changes you're making. So if you can identify that low hanging fruit and use that to build momentum, that can be very, very helpful. Joanne is also talking about the goal is to include ongoing education and delivery methods. So exactly, so you have this goal of making sure providing ongoing education. Erin says you're gonna need to replace the ERS champion, yes, as this person was likely influencing clinicians to change their behavior. So exactly, Erin. So the ERS champion was your, one of your strategies. It was an implementation strategy. And when that person is gone, they're actually a huge influencer on the entire intervention. So you're gonna to need to have a plan to replace them. So from there, the last thing in this situation, it's pretty hard because we haven't clearly defined exactly what those changes are. And I want you to always go back to thinking about the house. Are you repainting or are you tearing down walls? And if you're tearing down walls, stop. And as a group, ask yourselves, do we need to tear down this wall in order to move forward right now? And if the answer is no, I would suggest not tearing down the wall. But if you wanna repaint in any color that your stakeholders think is the best color for this intervention, go for it. So with that, I wrap it up um, and hand it back over to Chris. 